Now we looked at the uh, structure of the Song of Solomon and I believe that there are four movements to this book. I'm, I'm not gonna die on that hill, but it seems to make sense to me that everything uh, in the beginning of the book is building up towards this wedding, this moment of, of marriage, this wedding event, and then everything uh, from, uh, so that's uh, Song of Songs 1 through uh, chapter 3, verse 5. That's the pre-wedding. Hold on, it's coming. Um, and then secondly, the second movement is the wedding itself, Song of Songs 3, 6 through 4, 15. Then you have this short segment, which would uh, be depicting the wedding night, the consummation of the marriage, in Song of Songs uh, 4, 16 through 5, 1. And then from chapter 5, verse 2 through 8, 14, it all seems to be post-marriage, post-wedding, I should say. Yeah, so, so we've walked through uh, that, that structure part of, of what I believe, how I believe the book is structured. And even within that final structure, it's important to remember that there seem to be at least three substructures or, or three sub-segments to that final movement in the Song of Solomon. So chapter 5, 2 through chapter 6, verse 3, it seems that uh, the, the love of this bride has grown cold and then gets rekindled. And I, I say that because of the, the similar language that appears in chapter uh, 5. The woman is on her bed. Solomon is at the door. He's knocking, but she kind of stiff arms him. She's like, I'm, I'm already in bed. I've, I've already put, taken off my clothes. I've put my nightgown on. I'm, I'm not getting out of bed for you. And so Solomon leaves, and then all of a sudden her reason returns to her, and, and her heart is awakened, like, oh, man, what am I doing? And he gets, she gets up and starts chasing after Solomon and then finds him uh, in, in, in their garden, finds him waiting for her, not spurning her, not despising her, but waiting for her. Um, that same language of, of her being in her bed appears in chapter 3, at the beginning of chapter 3, I believe. Um, yeah, 3 verse 1, prior to the wedding, where Solomon's not at the door, but she's still filled with this anticipation and excitement to have him, to see him, to, to hold him, to bring him into her chamber, to have their marriage completed. So there was this fire that was before the wedding that seems to have cooled off after, after the wedding. And then in 6, 4 through 7, 9, you find this segment of Solomon reaffirming his love for her and even, even explaining to her that his love has deepened. Uh, uh, his love has only grown deeper as time has gone on. And then that final segment is the bride's love and longing for her husband, uh, now having been restored, being expressed. And so that's, that's how I see the, the book flowing. So um, that's all part of the introduction. Um, last week we did get into uh, the three contributions that Song of Songs uh, seems to make uh, for our understanding of marital love and contributions that it makes to the whole, uh, not just body of wisdom literature, but the whole, of, the whole testimony of Scripture. So, um, last, you guys remember, last week we, I, I mentioned that we should not be afraid to use this book in training our children, right? Uh, teaching them what true love within the boundaries of a marriage covenant ought to look like so, um, so that they're prepared and they're ready to not only love someone in that way, but they're also prepared to look for someone who shows the signs of uh, being able or being ready to love him or her in that way. Right? Uh, part of the you know, growing up, one of my greatest frustrations, and, and I don't want to Obviously, I'm not going to bring anyone out specifically. But one of my greatest frustrations that I saw within my family were, was just poor judgment on choosing a person to marry. It, it was just like, are you kidding me? This person was doing this to you prior to being married, and you still married him or her? It's like, what, what did you expect? Yeah, that's exactly right. What did you expect? And that this is part of the problem when we're just we're caught up in emotionalism and, and really what's driving us is more lust than love. It's, it's more about how this person is making us feel than it is about a sense of calling and devotion to loving this person for this person's well-being. 
So it's, it's, it's so me-centered in our day that that's why most marriages fail, because they get married for the wrong reasons, right? And uh, go ahead, brother. Oops. Just for uh, parents in here, start training your kids early, saying how they should be showing their potential spouse to you so you can weigh in because you'll be able to see those things. Sure, keeping that re relationship with them healthy yep. and, and so the, deep enough where the child's not afraid to bring Well, and that they'll trust you when you like say, trust your judgment. you know, in fishing terms, catch and release. I would release this one. Sure, yeah, yeah you fishermen, yeah, that's a good one. I'm probably going to use that one one day, brother, yeah. Oh, Addie, I think I would release this one, sweetie. <laughs> And the next five. <laughs> so, yeah, there is no one worthy of my daughters. I, I know that. And uh, anyway, um, but you know what? I'm not worthy of my wife either. So, um, now, you know, uh, something, probably the best way to, I, I think there needs to be discernment before you start walking a child through the book of Song of Solomon, they need to be at a certain age, and there needs to be a level of maturity and, and godliness to that child so that they can handle these uh, major concepts of what marital love looks like and how it's expressed. Um, however, that doesn't mean that prior to that child reaching that level of maturity, you can't in many ways show that child the kind of love that's depicted here in the Song of Solomon. So husbands and wives, one of the best ways you can train your children to know what godly love looks like is by exemplifying it for your children, right? So husbands being a Solomon type husband, now let's keep it within the context of this book, all right? But, but being, being a, a, the kind of, of husband that, um, that exemplifies this Proverbs 5 type attachment and devotion to your wife. And then wives being the kind of Titus 2, 4 women that, that, that show by example what it means to love your husband and your children. Um, example is the greatest teacher sometimes, right? Uh, living it out practically. So, yeah, I would, I would just encourage you. Don't, I heard when I was a kid, don't read the Song of Solomon. You know, and it's like, well, that's stupid because what you're saying is God's given us something in his word that's not healthy for us, that's not good for us at every stage of life. Now, again, there needs to be discernment, right? But uh, there should also, we should not be afraid to use this book as a manual to teach our children what marital love looks like. And then other people don't like the Song of Solomon because uh, when they read it, they realize that their own marriages don't live up to this ideal. And there's a lot of shame and there's guilt and sometimes there are decades of guilt, uh, things that you're having to deal with in your marriage. Um, you know, I think, I think you should not let that keep you from reading and studying this book together with your spouse, um, even if you are walking through difficult times together. God gave this book for a reason. It was to teach us, which assumes that we need to be taught, right? And so we should, even, no matter what we're feeling towards the Song of Solomon, we should take this as God's instructions for us and his encouragement to us to strive to be something better, right? So many people get content and, and with where they are in marriage and they just kind of bear down and deal with it, deal with life as it is, rather than saying, you know, according to God's word, this isn't healthy and we need to make changes by faith being instructed by God's word, we need to make real changes so that our marriage becomes something better. Right? We want our marriages to be exuding the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ, don't we? Don't we? Like, I hope you do. Goodness, if you don't, then I'd question whether or not you're a Christian. Man, Christ, is, Christ calls everything to be given to him in our lives. Everything, not just the Sunday morning, but our entire marriages. And I want that for my marriage. I'm not perfect in living that out. I'm not perfect in pursuing it. 
Jamie could come up and probably give you tons of testimonies of how, how I, have not, I have not lived up to the standard of the godly husband that God calls me to be. But man, that's my goal. That's my aim. And that's what the grace of Christ enables me to pursue, right? Um, we've been given all things. God's divine power has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. You have no excuse for not pursuing holiness and godliness and Christ-likeness in your marriages. None. Doesn't mean it's going to be comfortable. Right? You're, you're, you're talking about working through difficult situations with someone who has seen you at your worst. Right? Right? And maybe sometimes has seen you at your worst for extended periods of time, extended seasons. You know, that's where the the grace of the gospel has to come to bear upon your soul. you got to recognize that that's why Jesus Christ came. And the grace of Christ is enough for you in your marriage. You, you You don't need to be buried in shame over failures in your past. You just need to recognize those failures you need to learn from them and, and, and get up, dust yourself off with gospel grace and move forward. Say, yeah, man, we are, man, we stink. But Christ is so good and he's great, right? He's enough. Let's just let go of the nonsense and just move forward. There's grace for that. And, um, yeah, amen, preach. Yeah, I'm preaching to myself, so. You know, we, uh, I think especially in this time and day, one of the greatest ways that you and I are going are gonna to declare the power of the gospel is going to be in our families or through our families. You're talking about we're in, we're in a world where families are shattered and hearts are so, like, Culturally, we've been so hardened against the ideal because we've never seen it lived out. We've been so hardened against the ideal that we've just chucked the ideal away and said, you know what, we're just going to redefine things with the lesser standard and just be satisfied with that. And that never works. But we have such an opportunity in this day and age to, to be uh, to, to be examples of the gospel before the world in powerful ways, even through the witness of our families. So I'll tell you, a husband who is devotedly loving his wife is a rarity today. Doesn't talk about her negatively, doesn't backbite, doesn't, uh, doesn't enter into the gossip with the other guys around the water cooler or at the job site, right? Doesn't let his eyes wander around to some other object, doesn't even let his heart for a moment begin to desire those things. He cuts it off with the sword of the Spirit. And he sanctifies his heart and his body and mind for the sake of God and for his wife. Single, single men, that, that applies just as much to you, right? You're keeping yourself, we're going to get into that in a minute, hopefully. You're keeping yourself pure for the sake of the spouse whom God has ordained for you. And, um, you know, women, you talk about you have such an opportunity in this day to show what a godly woman really looks like, to show the beauty of it, right, to, to show the reality that it's not, it's not oppressive to be the kind of woman that God calls you to be in his word. You have that opportunity, and God has placed you in this time and in this context to rise up to the challenge, to put the beauty of the gospel on display through the way that you live your lives, through, through a life of godliness, right? You're adorning the gospel. Titus, 1 Timothy 2 and Titus 2. Anyway, I, we shouldn't let our failures bog us down. That's what the devil wants, guys. That's what, the, that's what Satan is after in each one of our lives. He wants to shame us so much that we don't have strength of soul to rise up in the gospel. Say, well, I know that that's what Jesus says to this person and that person, but that, that can't be me. That doesn't apply to me. The, the gospel grace doesn't apply to me the same way it applies to other people. That's just pride, and you need to let it go. 
Just repent and let it go and believe Christ's promise. Believe that he's enough. So off of that soapbox before I fall off. Um, Miss Bunny. I just to say hold, on, hold on, hold on just a second. No, Miss Bunny first, yep. yep. I work with a lot of younger gals, 20s and a little older, and they just have never, ever experienced um, a, a healthy mar- a, a mother or father or anything, and, and they're not even, they're separated and they're gone, and this is such a terrible situation that they're in. They have no idea of what, what, what it can be. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, when you see someone living the, the glory of, 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 of true marriage or, or a, a true, a healthy family. And when you see someone living that out, it's attractive. Uh, the world is attracted to that. Nobody wants instability. Nobody wants adultery. Nobody wants to be cheated on and, and despised. No one wants to be left, right? And so you've got the younger generation right now insulating themselves from that by just adopting the mentality that, man, I'm just going to go out and sleep with whoever I want. I'm just going to go do whatever I want. And I'm going to guard my heart that way rather than giving it to someone. I'm just going to live for the pleasures of this world. Well, that's just as, that's just as debilitating and fracturing as, as anything, as, as having your heart spurned by someone that you've trusted. When, when the world sees true godliness being lived out, there is an attractiveness to it. Whether they receive that and accept it or not, it's still what they long for in their hearts as image bearers of God. Miss Linda. I just wanted to encourage uh, the men, really, in marriage um, because of what you just said about uh, a husband's responsibility and characteristics. I was married to a man that exhibited many of those characteristics and not he wasn't perfect by any means, but it strengthens your wife when she sees this in her husband, and it strengthens her to grow in the grace and knowledge and the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, because she is seeing it lived out before her. And I was just, I was looking at 1 Peter um, 3, 7, husbands likewise dwell with, talking about wives, uh, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life. Heirs together of the grace of life. What a beautiful picture that is of marriage. That your prayers may not be hindered. And that last part, I think, is a question for you. (laughs) What does that mean? Yeah, what does that mean? (laughs) Um, So, uh, men... Have you read the uh, uh, family worship book that we're going to be going over next Saturday? Men? No? You need to read that. And if you don't have a copy, let me know. Uh, We'll try and get you one. But we're going to be talking about this. It's just about family worship, family devotions. How do we we lead in our homes in this this regard? It's very helpful. Within that book, I believe, there's, I believe I remember reading in that book, and it wasn't a different book. Um, the, uh, Brother Whitney talking about that, that uh, I've never heard this before. I used to think that dwelling with your wife in an understanding way was the means by which your own prayers weren't hindered. But in this book, there's a statement that's actually in the, in, uh, that, that, that phrase is in the plural. Your prayers would not be hindered. Yours is in plural. So it's talking about both the men and the women in that regard. And it seems to be talking about their uh, prayers, their praying together as husband and wife, spending time in prayer as husband and wives, husbands and wives together. And so whenever you have, uh, when you're not living the way that God calls you to live within your marriage, the last thing you want to do is go pray with that person. Um, there's, too much, there's too much realization that things are wrong, right? And... and when you can't pray with your spouse, that needs to be a, you need to recognize that as a red flag, that there's something wrong. Um, even if it's not between you, there's still something wrong, even if it's just in here, um, that needs to be worked out. It needs to be dealt with. There, there needs to be this restored sense, uh, this, this Genesis 2 restored sense of naked and unashamed, 
relationship. We need to have that in our marriages in order to be healthy marriages. And the only thing that gets to that is the gospel. Um, so that, that's my comment on what does it mean that your prayers are not be hindered. I, I, I think I agree with Don Whitney that, that that's talking about um, husband and wives, husbands and wives praying together, um, not hindering their prayers unto the Lord. But, but either way, it's true. Um, <laughs> if, if, uh, if it's not that, if it's talking about individual praying, um, not, not together, but separately, um, you know, if I, if I, if I uh, what, did he, what does the psalmist say? If I, if I harbored iniquity in my heart, you, O Lord, would not hear my prayers. Um, if you're living in, in, in sin and you're not being the kind of husband or wife that God intends you to be, um, well, as I just said, that too is sinful. Why, why, that would obviously be a hindrance in your praying. So, any other, any other comments on that? Statements? You, nothing back there? Okay. All right. So, we shouldn't uh, be afraid to teach our children what this book has to, has to say about marital love. Uh, we should definitely, for younger children, we should be exemplifying that kind of love for them. And then secondly, we shouldn't be ashamed to come to this book together with our spouses. Um, rather, we should take this as the example, the, the goal, and the, uh, what God wants us to strive after in our marriages, and then come together in agreement and say, yep, we haven't lived up to this before, and yet we're, we're both failures, but you know what? We can extend to one another the same grace that Christ has extended to us, and we can try to move forward together. And um, I, think, I think that's what the Lord would have us do. So uh, now as to the actual contributions. Uh, last week, um, the first one we looked at was just the, the contribution of uh, a theology of love in marriage. What, what, what does love actually mean? What does it mean to love someone in marriage? What does it look like? Uh, very often you hear this. Uh, statement, you know, love is an action. It's not an emotion. Um, it's not a feeling, right? What's that? Love is a verb. Is it a good song? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. DC talk. Yeah. Oh, DC talk. The good old days. Yeah. What will people think? Yeah, it's like, I don't care. Yeah, even before that, huh? Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, love is a verb, that, and that's, that's true. I don't want to take anything away from that, but love is not merely a verb. It's not merely an action. It's not merely a choice. It's not merely a covenant. It's not a bare covenant. That, that's not faithfulness within marriage. Just, well, I have agreed to love you, and I'm going to love you. I may not like you, and I'm probably not going to have much delight in you, but I'm going to love you. Like, th everyone knows that's not love. That's not love. You can express a kind of love to someone in that way where you say, you know what, there's, internally you're saying this, there's really not much in this person that I feel attracted to anymore. He has treated me so wrong for so long. She has done this to me. She doesn't respect me for so many years. I don't feel that I could love this person or like I love this person anymore. There's a kind of love that you can show even in that moment where you can say, you know what, I'm going to be faithful to the covenant I made with this person before the Lord. No matter how this person is treating me, I'm going to be faithful to my covenant. Right? There's a kind of love that you can show in that moment. But that's not, that's not the fullest expression of love that God intends for us to have in our marriages. What we find in the Saga of Solomon is that marital love is to be deeply a deeply felt, passionate commitment between a husband and wife. It may wane for a time, but... It ought always to be nourished and increased throughout the couple's marriage. So marriage always starts with passion, right? 
And I said last week, I'm still going to say it, uh, your love for, your passionate love for your spouse ought to increase as time goes on, not decrease. Now, it will mature and it will look differently than it looked early on. Your, your sense of love for that person is not going to look the same or express itself maybe in the same way as it did on your, uh, you know, the day after your, your wedding. But, but it will deepen, it will mature, it will be stronger, it will be, it'll have a, a sense of uh, realism, realistic love to it that, that never had, you never had early on. Yeah, that should be the norm. Uh, the world says, nope, everything's downhill from, from the wedding day. No, God says, no, that's just the beginning. You guys are, you guys are climbing this mountain of love together, and, and you should be higher at the end of your marriage covenant, whenever I call one of you home or I call both of you home, you should be higher on that mountain at that point than you were when you started climbing it. Uh, and we see that with, Song of, uh, with Solomon himself. Just look at uh, Song of Songs 4, verse 7 through 11. This is the wedding day. We already went over this, but, but you are altogether beautiful, my darling, and there's no blemish in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. May you come with me from Lebanon. Journey down from the summit of Amana, from the summit of Sinir and Hermon, from the dens of lions, from the mountains of leopards. Come away to safety with me. I'll protect you. I'll keep you. you have, you've made my heart. Just listen to verse 9. You've made my heart beat faster my sister, my bride, you have made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes. That's not bare commitment right there. That's not just, yeah, I'm going to make a covenant with you and we're going to enter into a marriage. I guess I can put up with you. Like, that is passionate. Uh, that, that's, um, I want to say ferocious. It's not, that's not the right word, but that's there's a, there's a depth of expression in that love and feeling in that love that's manifesting in this moment. That's, that's healthy. It's not healthy not to have that. Okay? How beautiful your love is, my sister, my bride. How much better your love than wine and the, and the fragrance of your oils than all kinds of spices. You see this? He's just caught up in this rapture, this... Uh, this uh, he's enamored with the beauty of his, of his wife, soon-to-be wife, his bride. And you see the same reality manifesting um, from the bride herself. Let's see here. In chapter 5, verses 10 through 16, just listen to the way she describes her, her husband, you know, she's love's grown cold. It's now been awakened. And now she's seeking after her husband and in, 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 in trying to find him. Like there's something has, has happened. And now she's pursuing that depth of relationship with him again. Verse 10, as she describes to the, uh, the, the, uh, the women um, among the city, they say, what kind of beloved is your beloved that you adjure us to come with you to find him? And she says, oh, my, my beloved is dazzling in, and is it ruddy? Is that how you pronounce that? I always want to say Rudy, but that's one D, right? Ruddy. He's outstanding among 10,000. There's not a single man that compares to my husband. His head is like gold, pure gold. His locks are like clusters of dates. Unfortunately, Jamie can't say that about my hair. It's, it's receding. It's a, if it's, well, never mind, I, won't, I won't go that way. Um, black as a raven. Not so much anymore. I'm losing my color. His eyes are like doves beside streams of water, bathed in milk he, he, and, uh, and reposed in their setting. His cheeks are like a bed of balsam. Banks of sweet-scented herbs. His lips are lilies dripping with liquid myrrh. His hands are rods of gold set with uh, burial. His, his abdomen is carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. His legs are pillars of alabaster set on pedestals of pure gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as the cedars. His mouth is full of sweetness, and he is wholly desirable. This is my beloved. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. 
That's not a cold description of what he looks like, right? That's very passionate. That's a lively description of, of, of how she sees her husband, um, Lauren. I'm just thinking of how <clears throat> in the reality of, of loving one another, in, in the realities of our failings and shortcomings and all of that, that yeah. you know, our, our pattern, our example certainly is our Lord in the way in which he has loved his bride, that he did not wait until his bride had been redeemed and enabled to be faithful and honoring to him That's to right. set his love upon her. He That's set right. his love upon her and then went about sacrificing himself to redeem her. Yeah. And, yeah. and so yeah. are we to be, yes. in a sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, chose to love her fully and freely. Um, and, uh, and then to, uh, oh, what was I going to say? Um, Ephesians 5 is obviously in mind, right? Uh, he loved us. He gave himself up for us that he might sanctify us, right? And, and uh, by his own love, purifying us for himself. Yeah, yeah that's right. And we're going to get to that hopefully, in just a second. Um, but my, my whole point in bringing this up is just that cultivating deep emotional engagement with one another in marriage is the path of God's wisdom for marriage. Right? So cultivating this kind of expressive, passionate love within marriage is the wisdom of God for your marriage. Right, so this is, uh, Schneider writes uh, the following. He says, to rejoice in the wife of one's youth, to be satisfied with her breast and captivated by her love is to walk in the path of wisdom that, ra- that is rounded or grounded in the fear of the Lord. There's, there's, when you give yourself to delighting in the woman whom God has, has given you in this covenant of marriage, or, or you give yourself to loving this man whom the Lord has provided for you in this covenant of marriage, you are walking according to God's wisdom at that point. You're cultivating this, this deeper, this deeper uh, sense of love and appreciation and admiration and um, adoration for one another. This is the principle of 1 Corinthians 7, 1 to 5, right? This is godliness in marriage is procured in a certain way. Um, by giving, giving uh, yourselves to each other very fully. Schneider quotes from Duane Garrett. Duane Garrett writes, the, the passion that demands fidelity is also a shield to fidelity. The passion that demands fidelity is also a shield to fidelity. To try to live without the passions of love is not merely frustratingly hopeless. It is unwise, unbiblical, and an open door to the very lust it is trying to bar. So when you don't have this kind of satisfaction in your marriage, you're going to be looking for that satisfaction somewhere else. That's, that's his point. And God's wisdom is that we have this covenant relationship with one another where we pursue deep and passionate love with each other. Um, we have this avenue to be loved and to love the way that we know we were made to be loved and to love with our spouses and and the, the, the less we give ourselves to that pursuit, uh, the more of a dangerous situation we leave ourselves in. We open ourselves to all kinds of adultery or just that uh, slow and progressive sense of detachment from our spouse. The second contribution, let's see if we can work through this one a little more quickly. I doubt it. But... Um, the, uh, the bliss of marital love. So the first contribution is uh, just the nature of love or a theology of love within marriage, what that is, what that looks like. The second is, is the bliss of marital love. Schneider writes, or Sh- Schneider. Schreiner writes, the bliss of marital love is not described crassly or literally, Instead, the author celebrates the joys of love in imagery that is delicate and lyrical. 
Now, don't kid yourselves or don't lie to me. You know that whenever you've read some of these things in the Song of Solomon, you've laughed to yourself. Like this one. Your teeth are like a flock of newly shorn ewes. They all bear twins. In other words, or as he says, not one of them is missing. <laughs> She's got all her teeth. Wonderful. Your lips are, well, we'll, we'll pass that one. Um, your neck is like the Tower of David, built with rows of stone, on which are hung a thousand shields, all the round shields of the mighty men. Uh, I wanted to say that one. I'm not going to, but you are, you, <laughs> parts of your body are like twin gazelles. <laughs> your belly is a heap of wheat. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> Obviously, we're not talking about literal things here, right? Uh, these, are, these are just images that are being presented in its own day to show something of the desirability of, of the person. And, uh, and what it's communicating to us is, is a blissfulness within marriage. It's really relating to what we just talked about and of the nature of love. But the Song of Solomon gives us a depiction of intense devotion between a man and a woman and a celebration of the beauty and excitement of sexual love within a marriage. What that tells us is that Marital love is supposed to be blissful. It's supposed to be filled with happiness. It's supposed to be filled with joy. Um, husbands and wives ought to be elated uh, with one another in their marriage union. And uh, the more that they can enjoy that with one another, the less risk there is of either one being tempted to enjoy that exhilaration with someone else. Or we could say with something else in our day of pornography widespread porn use. And uh, I think, you know, it's interesting too, we need to, I don't have time to, to go into this fully, but Schreiner points out that the best expressions, the best moments of, of expressive love within marriage is merely a taste of the exhilarating love that God created us to have uh, from the very beginning. This was the kind of love that, that we would constantly live in with one another had sin never entered into the world um, and corrupted everything and brought shame and guilt and fear. Um, that's what I, so very interesting thought that, that in your best of moments in your marriage where there's such there, there's the deepest satisfaction, that's but a taste of the kind of love that God, God created us to experience within marriage. However, there are a couple of important observations to keep in mind relating to this blissfulness of marriage, and, and we'll close today talking about it. Um, there are a, a really important observations to keep in mind. Number one, there's a refrain throughout this book that says, do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. What is that talking about? What does that mean? Not to stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Any thoughts? No? Well, I think what that, what that means, in essence, I've read a couple of different uh, thoughts on it, but I think that in essence, what that means is that a person needs to have reached a level of maturity, both physically and emotionally. A person needs to have reached a level of maturity before he or she can enjoy the bliss of marriage or marital love appropriately. You need to be mature enough before you allow this to be awakened. You need to be mature enough to handle it and to be able to engage with it appropriately and responsibly um, with a clear mind before you allow it to be awakened. Now, it's interesting. It says, do not stir it up until it pleases. That means you're not stoking the fires, right? You're, you're, not, 
You're not shaking the, uh, the dressing bottle to get all the sediments mixed in. You're, you're leaving it alone, and you're not introducing anything into the situation, into the person's life, that would, uh, that would, that would act as a means, of, a spark of lighting those flames. You're not allowing anything into that person's life until it's the appropriate time. Somebody had something? I heard that. James? Two quick things. Yeah. One little goofy. Sure. Um, when students at school talk about dating sorts of things, my first piece of advice is don't. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, exactly. Yep. But then if they press a little bit further, the second piece of advice, which is not not always totally serious, but it's something like, and this is something someone else said to me one time, if you can't see yourself married inside of a year, then what are you doing? Not that you have to get married inside of a year, but there's maybe a gauge there of, is this couple ready for that sort of commitment? Hmm. And I can think of students that I've had in high school that have been very close to being ready for that, yeah. where the most, the majority of them are not. Um, but I think of um, a couple that I knew in high school that got married last summer, um, not too far out of high school, and um, I could say I think they were ready for it. They had that maturity that you're describing, um, and I think most of them uh, <laughs> back away from that sort of advice because it's difficult to imagine that. But that's just an indication, I think, of not being prepared for that commitment. Yeah, and that it's been aroused, it's been stirred up too early, right? There's not a maturity to handle it, yeah. Um, you know, uh, I think that things can at times be done where there's a, it can be done well, where maybe there's, there's an older teenager who's met someone in, in high school or something, things are, Things seem to be just well fit together as far as personality and, and, and whatever. There's been this awakening between this, these people. I think that it's I think that can be okay so long as there is deep and uh, uh, even invasive and intrusive involvement on both ends of, of when we're talking about the family. So uh, both the woman's family and the man's family or the young woman and the young man's family, both of them are, are intimately involved in everything that is going on in that relationship. So there's nothing hidden, right? Um, I, I get that from, uh, actually, I, I think it's, it's interesting that in chapter 2, verse 7, with this cry not to awaken love before it pleases, is this express, expression of the reality that this is being done within the context of community. So it says, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the hinds of the field, that you do not arouse or awaken my love until it pleases. There's this, there's this sense of, of communal involvement in the relationship that's developing uh, between Solomon and his bride. I think that that would be a, a, a wise principle, especially for us as parents, to walk through uh, uh, these more challenging times that are upon us and coming, uh, to walk through that with eyes wide open and saying, listen, son, daughter, like we are going to be involved in every nook and cranny of this relationship until you are prepared and ready to take this responsibility on yourself. Um, and you're just going to have to deal with that. Either that or you're going to have to be done with this relationship. Like those are the terms. This is my house. These are my rules. I'm looking out for your well-being I need you to trust me. Um, you know, we live in a, in a day of unrestrained and unrestricted passions, right? A, a day where uh, it's abnormal to talk about a 13-year-old not sleeping around. As if that expectation is too much to, to lay upon young people. It's like... Um, you know, we, kids are expected to engage emotionally and experientially 
in love long before it's the appropriate time for them to do so. And the only thing that happens as a result of that are broken hearts and, and spoiled gardens, right? Uh, this Song of Solomon presents each person or the, the marriage relationship as a garden that's being cultivated and being enjoyed by both spouses. All you're doing whenever you're encouraging dating prior to marriage, all you're doing, like, okay, <laughs> collect my thoughts here. It's emotional for me. I've had to tell people before to stop talking to my daughters about boyfriends. And I'm not ashamed of that. It does not embarrass me to tell someone, I don't need you to implant those thoughts into my four-year-old daughter right now. She doesn't need that concept in her mind. And I need you to respect that. Either that or you can't be around our family. I'm serious about protecting my children. And I, because I was not protected, okay? And I know exactly what happens when you're not being protected by someone. I know, I know what happens in the world. Don't talk to me like I'm some fuddy-duddy, foolish old-timer. I grew up in the world. I was fully engaged. Love was aroused when I was very young. You would be shocked. Yeah, well, yes, but I would say the, the system... Meaning male and female. Yeah, oh. The attraction is designed to fail. Today. No, the way always, we go about doing it. Always, without having protection, God designed us to be aroused by someone who's handsome or beautiful. So it, it was designed to fail in the sense, in the sense of it's a natural... It was, it was designed to uh, be a tool Correct. within the right setting, Correct. right? And in the wrong setting, yeah. it Exactly. So in our over-sexualized and child-grooming culture, mm -hmm. um, we are surrounded by the wrong setting all the time. And, and our children are surrounded by that kind of setting from the moment they step into public school. The moment we, we let them go out into the world, um, unprotected by those who are entrusted with their protection. Um, oh man, it's just too much, too much, I'm sorry guys, it's my own, my own failures here, but let me just say this and then we're gonna be done um, for today. Anyone who has not reached uh, the level of maturity that is both physically and emotionally ready to handle the responsibility of marriage, anyone who has not reached that level of maturity does not even need to entertain ideas about a romantic relationship or marriage with another person. So if a young man, for example, is not in a financial position where he can say to a woman, come away with me, Come away from your father and your mother's house. Come down with me and be with me. If a man is not in a financial position to say something like that to a woman, he has no business thinking about marrying her. If a young man is, uh, excuse me, if, if, if a uh, young man and a woman are not in an emotional level of maturity where they're ready to leave their father and mother, leave their home and their family and cling together in this new family that the Lord has created. If they're not emotionally ready to handle that kind of separation from mom and dad and that union with another person, then they shouldn't even be thinking about marriage yet. So we'll, we'll pick up on this next week. Um, you guys have to suffer through one more week of Song of Solomon. But uh, we'll hopefully finish it, finish it then. Uh, let's pray together. Father, we, we do thank you for the wisdom that you've given us in your word. And we recognize in the world around us all the evidence of what happens when we ignore the wisdom that you've given us. Lord, I pray that you would, you would help us uh, take seriously what you've uh, given us here in the Song of Solomon. Lord, that you would help us walk with... Uh, the fear of the Lord, uh, both in our marriages and, and then as, if we are single in this room, uh, prior to that marriage happening. Lord, we, we, want, we want to be a garden locked up 
we, we, we don't want to let the foxes run through the vineyard and spoil the vine. Lord, I, I pray that you would give us grace, both in our marriages and in our singleness, if that's us, that you'd give us grace to walk according to your wisdom given to us in the Song of Solomon, and uh, that, that our marriages would flourish as we seek to implement these principles of your wisdom given to us in this, in this wonderful book. Lord, we love you and we pray that you'd be with us. Would you please bless our time of corporate worship? Uh, enable our hearts to be stirred with a holy love for Jesus Christ. And may our faith be firmly planted in his finished and all-sufficient work for our salvation. Lord, we pray this and we pray you'd be with us in Jesus' name. Amen.